Rajada says Fonseca's statement was made with the President's knowledge. Ministry of Power assures no power interruptions with the increased demand. North Korea defies sanctions with another missile test. Good evening, this is your News at 9 and I'm Indi Riyamwat. We take a look at your top story tonight. President Maitripala Sirisena confirmed today that the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit in Sri Lanka will not see the signing of any bilateral agreements. The Indian Premier is due to visit the country in lieu of the UN International Vesak celebration in Colombo during May. The President made these remarks at an event in Batiklo today. The function to celebrate the centenary of the Oddamavadi Central College in Batikalo was held today under the patronage of President Maitri Pala Sirisena. President Sirisena unveiled the new three-storey administrative building complex at the college. Subsequently, he visited the trade and education exhibition held at the premises. President Sirisena then addressed the gathering. There have been many false rumours on social media such as Facebook that Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit to Sri Lanka is intended to sign agreements or to claim sections of the country. The Indian Prime Minister is coming to Sri Lanka upon my invitation. He will not be engaging in any other official activities other than participating in the UN International Vesak Festival. He will not sign any documents on projects or investments. Therefore, I kindly request the public not to fall for these false rumours. The Ministry of Power and Renewable Energy assures that there will not be any power interruptions or power scheduling brought on by the prevailing dry weather conditions. Director of Development at the Ministry of Power and Renewable Energy, Sulakshan Jawadana, elaborating to other Deranas, said the daily demand for electricity has also increased. Due to the prevailing uh, dry and warm weather conditions, uh, we are experiencing uh, increase of daily demand of the electricity. Nowadays, uh, we are experiencing 44 gigawatt uh, hours per day demand. We are kindly requested to the customers to use uh, electricity and utilize electricity in an efficient manner. To use uh, more efficient uh, lighting equipment such as LED bulb. Uh, as per the measurement provided in the power supply, we offered customers who have generators uh, under the self generation scheme then uh, that they can use their generators to generate electricity for their own consumption. Although we are providing uninterrupted power supply, we are facing a lot of challenges, but uh, we are planning to provide electricity without any uh, interruption. That's what we are targeting to provide uninterrupted power supply. So we have not scheduled any sort of power interruption or power scheduling. Minister of Health, Nutrition and Indigenous Medicine, Dr. Rajatha Senaratna today clarified the circumstances under which he made the statement pertaining to the much-discussed new responsibility of Minister Field Marshal South Fonseca. He asserted that the statement was made with the knowledge of the President. The Minister made the remark responding to questions raised by media following a function in Colombo. <laughs> Sri Lanka Freedom Party cannot lie because this was discussed at the cabinet. The president will bring a clause under the Right to Information Act to inform media the developments of the cabinet meetings. As the cabinet spokesperson, I declare what took place. I don't make any responsible statements. If I make any statement, I do so with the acknowledgement of the president. Addressing the function in Colombo, the minister unveiled the government's plan to uplift the health sector in Sri Lanka. 
Although Sri Lanka is well positioned to achieve universal health coverage, the current demographic, epidemiological and economic transitions are challenges to ensuring universal and equitable health financing. Meanwhile, to reduce the waiting list for surgeries such as cardiac, neuro, kidney uh, transplant, etc. In some general government hospitals, we are now in the process of working out modalities for outsourcing such surgeries when, we, when and where necessary to private hospitals under public-private partnership programs with considerable cost savings to the government. On the other hand, we are also looking at joining hands with the private sector in upgrading and maintaining of, of biomedical equipment to improve the efficiency of lab services with considerable savings on service replacement and repair costs. We are now in the process of negotiating with an aviation company to provide a helicopter amb air ambulance system to get victims to a &E centers speedily. <laughs> Teacher assistants attached to the government schools tend to receive an increase in their allowance. The government has arrived at a decision to increase the existing monthly allowance of 6,000 rupees by 4,000 rupees. The cabinet paper tabled by the Minister of Education, Akila Viraj Karevasam, was granted approval and accordingly, teacher assistants will be paid the increased allowance effective from the 1st of February this year. The minister tabled the relevant cabinet paper in consideration of the relevant cost of living and a request made by the teacher assistants. Meanwhile, the Minister of Education has also taken measures to make 1,660 workers at the Central Cultural Fund permanent. Most of them have come to the service through a manpower firm formed during the previous regime. In consideration of complaints filed by the relevant employees, the minister has directed the Central Cultural Fund to seize all associations with the manpower firm in question. The statement released by the ministry says the card made permanent has the increased or rather has necessary qualifications. With that, we're going for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more on the other side. Welcome back to the news. Art is an aspect of human nature often taken for granted. We see works of art, enjoy them, but we hardly ever stop to imagine the time and effort spent on creating them. Our reporter H.A. Sadini steps out into the Colombo Open Air Art Gallery, known to many as the Art Street, to give you an insight into the lives of those who are behind the colourful canvases. The artists behind this array of masterpieces form a union of not only full-time professionals but also freelancers who channel their creativity through years of hard practice. Walking through the Colombo Open Air Art Gallery, we encounter silent heroes sailing through the ever-shifting seas of artistry. Focus on the sector in general within the island is considerably less in comparison with foreign countries. Needless to say, street art struggles even more so. In foreign countries, we find dedicated art streets where artists can harness the full extent of their skills and earn recognition along with a considerable income. In a few words, Sri Lankan street art simply needs help. Our street artists wait all day long beside their paintings with only a handful of passers-by stopping to even take a look. Out of that handful, just a few are customers. The artist's earnings are unpredictable, tied to tourism rates which fluctuate with the season. Saddest of all, their status as artists is often regarded dispensable compared to other jobs purely because of social prejudice. It is difficult to work solely as an artist. Artists could work full-time if the tourism ministry took up this issue and created a special tourism spot here. Our union for the Colombo Open Air Gallery is currently working to introduce such a concept. The recognition given to art in Sri Lanka is a little less, especially for street art. Only a few tourists come here. Most of them visit art galleries. We are expecting to put up stalls. Once the stalls come up in a month or so, we will be able to improve the situation. The issue is often that tour guides operate according to their own agendas. 
Unlicensed tour guides do take tourists down the art street where they demand steep discounts that the artists are unable to grant. In contrast, most licensed tour guides overlook the art street in favor of renowned art galleries and branded corporate outlets. No matter what trials the artists face, some hold a pragmatic view on their career, appreciating the satisfaction and freedom they derive from their work. We enjoy a balance of spiritual as well as economic fulfillment through art. As artists and as observers of life, the society and the world, we are happy with what we receive. We don't need to think any further than that. As free artists of the art street, we lead very satisfactory lives. We receive the outcome we deserve for our efforts. As we spoke to the artists, we heard their silent call for attention. Why must we leave them sidelined at an age where creativity is given much prominence? And in your business segment tonight, Minister of City Planning and Water Supply Rauf Hakim stresses the need to revise water tariffs during a public gathering in Kurunagala yesterday. We provide 1,000 litres of water to the public for 12 rupees, while they pay 60 rupees for a litre of bottled water. This cannot be done any further. It costs a lot to purify water so the public are able to drink straight off the tap. An underground water pipe system is spread across the country and its maintenance is costly. They consider it to be the biggest crime when we talk about revising the water tariffs. We need to take an immediate decision on revising water tariffs in order to sustain the National Water Supply and Drainage Board. <laughs> And now let's take a look at stories making international headlines in the world of business and technology this week. It's been a fast week in tech for while ride-hailer Uber faces lawsuits and an image problem, Chinese giant Didi Chuxing has raised $5.5 billion with its record funding round valuing the company at around $50 billion. Apple, however, has put the brakes on billions of dollars in payment to chip supplier Qualcomm as the company's battle over technology licensing revenue that, if cut off, will damage Qualcomm's main source of profit and pad Apple's margins. Amazon's stock raised to an all-time high as the company posted a 23% jump in sales, though concern remains among analysts about its variety in focus. A surge in after-hours trading added $3.3 billion to founder Jeff Bezos' fortune as the stock hit $965, with the 53-year-old now just $5 billion off, being the world's richest man. Google chief executive Sundar Pichai picked up nine figures for the third year running, receiving compensation in Class C shares worth $199 million for 2016. Welcome back in sports tonight. Sunrisers Hyderabad beat the Kings 11 Punjab last um, night in the IPL, courtesy of an aggressive start that saw the post uh, saw them rather post an imposing 207 run total batting first. While chasing has been a winning trend in the IPL so far, the Hyderabad top order was simply too strong for Punjab. The Hyderabad openers David Warner and Shikhar Dhawan launched a combined assault on Punjab's bowling that paid dividends. A 107-run opening stand ended when Warner fell for 51. Dhawan made 77 and Kane Williamson smashed 54 off 27 to take Hyderabad to 207. In reply, Kings XI started strongly through Martin Guptill, but he fell for 23, followed by Vora for 2 and Maxwell for naught. Sean Marsh anchored the chase with 84, but the Punjab approach of seeing out Rashid Khan left them 26 short of the target, with the leg spinner going for only 16 in his four overs. 
And in tennis, Maria Sharpova won again yesterday in what is proving to be a fairy tale comeback so far as she broke a place, or rather booked a place, in the semifinals of the Stuttgart Open. Meanwhile, in Barcelona, nine-time champion Rafael Nadal and world number one Andy Murray also reached the last four, but Murray made his exit a very short while ago against Dominic Thiem. Maria Sharapova, who needs a final appearance in Stuttgart to assure herself of a spot in the qualifying draw for the French Open, triumphed in straight sets against Annette Kontaveit. Kristina Mladenovic, the latest to question Sharapova having been awarded several wildcard entries, is her semi-final opponent. Men's world number one Andy Murray had to dig deep to see off Albert Ramos Vinolas, who knocked him out in Monaco last week in three sets. Murray lost the first set 2-6, but took the second and third 6-4, 7-6. Rafael Nadal also booked a spot in the semi-finals, beating unseeded Korean Chung Hyun 7-6, 6-2. While Murray has lost to fourth seed Dominic Thiem, Nadal will face Argentine Horacio Zeballos in the last four. And the World Cheerleading Championships have come to a close in Florida with participation from 63 countries as the sport bids to join the Olympics. The event is sanctioned by the International Cheer Union, which was recognized in December by the International Olympic Committee, giving the sport provisional status and three years to show that they belong at the Games. The USA picked up goals at the COED and all-girl premier events, while Chile and England topped the coed and all girls elites. England also picked up a silver, as did Germany, Finland, and Chinese Taipei. We move on to one of our headline stories tonight. A senior lecturer at the University of Muratua makes evident the garbage dump in Mithotamulla is still unstable. Senior lecturer Dr. Mahesh Jayavira said that the Mithotamulla garbage dump is still at risk of catching fire. There is a risk of fire as significant carbon monoxide buildup is relevant at or rather prevalent in certain sections within the dump. There were speculations over a possible explosion at the garbage heap due to high methane levels. Addressing a media briefing recently, Dr. Jayavira revealed there is no danger of an explosion at the site. He, however, made evident the garbage dump is in fact at risk of fire due to high levels of carbon monoxide. We found the risk of failure is rather minimal. The methane level is rather low so that there is no risk of explosion. But we found that the carbon monoxide levels are on the rise which indicates that there is a risk of fire. We have taken the necessary actions. Residents of Visitunavatta adjacent to the garbage heap blames the authorities for lack of action following the area being identified as a high risk zone. I have a two and a half year old child. This house is not safe for her. We were not properly informed. People in the areas which were identified as high risk zones were seen evacuating from their residences today. Meanwhile, the NBRO, Army Engineering Corps and the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Muratua, as well as officials of the Ministry of Science and Technology looked into the methane build-up at the Mithotamulla garbage dump today. We did in 2012, but we measured only the gas in the atmosphere and not the internal levels. We have informed the officers of the Disaster Management and NBRO about possibility of an explosion at the garbage dump since 2012. Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology have deployed drones and sensors at the site in order to constantly monitor changes at the garbage dump. Meanwhile, the security units today installed a drainage network around the garbage dump to make the water emanating from the dump flow efficiently. 
In the meantime, a senior professor of the Department of Geology at the University of Peradeniya inspected Gohagoda garbage dump in Kandy, which poses a threat to the locals. Inspecting the site, Professor Atula Sena Ratna clarified the gas emanation from the garbage dump yesterday. There is a possibility of a methane buildup which could release. It could be a daily phenomenon. I think this is undoubtedly a gas release and the gas has no relation with the atmosphere. If it is a tornado, it will travel through the atmosphere and make landfall. This is not a tornado. Therefore, I think this is a gas release. Gohagoda dump was identified as one of the dangerous dumps likely to collapse. Following the decision to evacuate residents in the area, the government today commenced property assessment. And in your headline making international story tonight, North Korea has tested yet another ballistic missile amid escalating tensions and warnings from the international community. The launch took place hours after the United Nations Security Council discussed North Korea's missile program. The missile, fired early this morning, exploded seconds after being launched and did not leave North Korean territory. In response, U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted, accusing North Korea of showing disrespect towards China. The launch was swiftly condemned by Japan and South Korea. The missile launch is a great threat to our country and we cannot allow this. We strongly condemn this. We hope that China will take a constructive and solid stance for the denuclearization of North Korea and the implementation of the UN resolution. <laughs> And in Brazil, protesters burned buses, clashed with police in several cities and marched on President Michel Timmer's pres uh, residence yesterday amid the nation's first general strike in more than two decades. The strike was called in protest of Timmer's efforts to push austerity measures that would weaken labor laws and trim pensions. Public transport was crippled in several major cities along with the closure of schools, factories, banks and businesses across Brazil. Protesters set fire to at least eight commuter buses and blocked the entrances of airports and metro stations. Police clashed with demonstrators in several cities, firing tear gas in efforts to clear roadways blocked by burning barricades. The government, however, argues that the austerity measures are necessary to pull Brazil out of its worst ever recession. Ahead of his 100th day of presidency, Donald Trump yesterday addressed the nation, uh, or rather the National Rifle Association, in an attempt to renew his standing among a conservative base that is wary after he backtracked on several of his election campaign promises. The first sitting president to address the NRA was Ronald Reagan in 1983. Trump said that an eight-year assault on gun ownership had come to an end and vowed to press forward with plans for his border wall despite recent setbacks. And by the way, we will build the wall no matter how low this number gets or how high this number. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. You see what they're doing, right? So why do you need a wall? We need a wall. Build the wall. We'll build the wall. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. That's an easy one. We're going to build the wall. We need the wall. Trump also reaffirmed his campaign pledges to expand gun ownership rights and roll back some of the restrictions instituted under former President Barack Obama. So let me make a simple promise to every one of the freedom-loving Americans in the audience today. As your president, I will never, ever infringe on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Never, ever. Since the first of this year, there have been 19,557 incidents of gun-related violence in the United States, including almost 5,000 deaths, with over 1,000 children under 18 killed or injured, according to non-profit Gun Violence Archive. 
According to research by Mother Jones on data between 1982 and 2012, 79% of mass shootings in the United States were perpetrated with legally owned firearms and in not a single case was the killing halted by a civilian using a gun. And Turkey has blocked all access inside the country to the online encyclopedia Wikipedia, one of the world's most popular websites. Turkish media report that the provisional order will need to be backed by a full court ruling in the next few days. Authorities did not cite a reason for the ban, but the public speculates that it may have been in a bid to suppress criticism on Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan's Wikipedia page, which extensively describes his crackdown on media and the opposition. And in your weather forecast for tomorrow, um, there is a high possibility of thunder showers occurring in the next few days across uh, several parts of the country. Accordingly, showers or thunder showers may occur at a few places in the western, Sabaragamo, southern, and Uwe provinces. There may be temporarily localized strong winds during thunder showers. General public is advised to take adequate precautions to minimize damages caused by lighting activity. And that's all from your primetime news at 9. But before we go, we'd like to leave you with visuals from a part of our coastal belt. Minister, have a pleasant evening. Good night. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Adhaverana 24-7.